We've got to be scientific because the, the brain is an organ like any other organ. And a biomedical approach with peer support, family support, cognitive behavioral therapy, support of housing, you know, a good diet, maybe some exercise. Guess what? It's all part of the answer. It's not one versus the other. My name is Bethy Atkins, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you to the Cambridge Public Library. Tonight, I'm extremely pleased to have Patrick J. Kennedy with us to discuss his memoir, A Common Struggle, A Personal Journey Through the Past and Future of Mental Illness and Addiction. A former Rhode Island congressman, Patrick has become one of the nation's leading political voices on mental illness, addiction, and other brain diseases. He is the founder of the Kennedy Forum, which unites the community of mental health and co-founder of One Mind for Research, which sponsors brain research and open science collaboration. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Kennedy. for that uh, very kind introduction and the warm reception. Uh, as I understand it, the way the time has uh, been allotted, I should speak for some undisclosed uh, period of time, uh, <laughs> and then to be followed by Q&A. And because I'm a former politician and I'm just now feeling, the, feeling it again <laughs> since I've been out on the road, you know, like I used to when I was out on the campaign trail, like I could actually give speeches and people would listen to me again, uh, just like the good old days. I, I might take full advantage of that opportunity to speak for you tonight and never stop. So um, I will state that I probably will get to what I would say in my speech and most of the questions and answers anyway. So maybe what we could do is almost dive in to the Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll state from the very beginning that um, uh, I'm really happy to have uh, Bill Emmett here who uh, runs the uh, Kennedy Forum. And uh, Bill was uh, head of the uh, NAMI chapter in Rhode Island uh, when I was a state representative down there uh, in 1988, if you can imagine. At the age of 21, I was elected to the state legislature in Rhode Island. And then uh, at the age of 27, as the youngest member of Congress, I was elected to represent Rhode Island's first congressional district. And then I went on at the age of uh, 31 and was elected to Democratic leadership in the House of Representatives. And I just want to make it clear to everyone here in this room tonight that none of it had to do with my last name being Kennedy whatsoever. <laughs> it was all that good looks and personality that came through. Uh, so that's the, the secret is out. That's the secret's out. But Bill, um, really, uh, I credit with really being among the very first people to get me involved in the public policy of mental health. Um, and. Uh, he got involved because it was a family issue in his family, and it turned him into an advocate, and he uh, uh, took over the Rhode Island chapter of NAMI. And then how fortuitous for me that when I ultimately championed the parity law on the federal level, uh, Bill at that stage in his life was a chair of the Campaign for Mental Health Reform nationally. So he went from being head of Little NAMI in Little Rhode Island to being head of the Campaign for Mental Health Reform, which organized all the national groups, including NAMI, Mental Health America, both the psychiatrists and psychologists and all the affiliate uh, professions. Uh, he was in charge of bringing them all together for advocacy. And once again, he was in talking to me about mental health. First as a state rep and then when I was in the Congress. And now when I left Congress, obviously, I talked to him about how do I you know, continue to stay involved in this, uh, this mental health policy space and what are your uh, recommendations? 
And he said, well, you know, there's still a need for us to convene people. And the, the parity law was a great excuse for us to have everybody come in together. Because unfortunately in the mental health world, we're all fragmented. Everybody's siloed. And when we were doing the parity uh, struggle, it was really one that involved everybody. So, you know, whether you were a psychiatrist, you wanted parity. If you were a psychologist, you wanted parity. If you were a social worker, you wanted parity. Consumer, you wanted parity. Everybody wanted parity. And of course, on all the other issues, everyone would be at each other's throats. <laughs> but on parity, they were all together. So Bill uh, convinced me that even though we had passed the parity law, you know, it wasn't over yet. You know, because we all know that even though a law can be passed, uh, uh, it's only the beginning. The next phases are its implementation and enforcement. And those were the two remaining legs of the stool that we hadn't uh, completed work with. So uh, he said, we should do something to keep this thing going. So that's what ultimately became um, the Kennedy Forum, which we launched on the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy signing of the Community Mental Health Act of 1963. So the beauty of that historic anniversary was anything JFK historic was beautiful. Uh, that is a given. But the fact that it was one more of an opportunity to bring everybody together. Because if you invited them to the John F. Kennedy Library for a 50th of JFK, I mean everybody would show up. And they did, once again. And we, you know, all I needed to do was, uh, you know, quote, President Kennedy, you know, who said, uh, the mentally ill need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our communities. And you really can't come up with a better sentence that uh, really captures the biggest challenge we have in this space than, than that one sentence. You know, you could say that today and people would say, oh, that's profound. And he said that 50 years ago. The mentally ill need no longer be alien to our affections. I mean, you think about the way the media covers the uh, mental, people with mental illness. You can think about the way the, you know, the rest of our culture characterizes people with mental illness. And boy, didn't he just nail it with that. And then he added to that, nor should they be on the help of our Communities. He didn't say beyond the help of our psychiatric hospitals. He didn't say beyond the help of our psychiatrists or beyond the help of our pharmaceutical companies or beyond the help of... He said beyond the help of our communities, meaning all of us. And that's the answer today as well. So, you know, the biggest challenge we have is taking ourselves back and looking at this from the forest from the trees because we're also trying to fix every broken piece in the broken mental health system that we fail to take in the big picture and that is this isn't just the job of you know the medical system this is the job of educators teachers who are on the front lines this is the job of family members who are already on the front lines. This is the job, sure, of insurance companies, but this is also the job of the Department of Labor in charge of you know, workforce uh, support. This is the job of the housing department to make sure there's adequate housing. You know, this is the job of the Department of Transportation who guarantees transportation. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is much bigger than what we always do when we define this issue in the most narrow of terms, uh, thereby letting people fall out of the system. So, so John F. Kennedy got it right, as he did so many times, uh, and 50 years ago. So he signed that incredible bill that said we shouldn't uh, put people in institutions uh, wherever it was possible for them to be treated in their communities. That ought to be the premium. And, and his whole vision was to fund community mental health such that 
if they did have to go to an institution, it was as the as last option that we would have a really well built out community mental health system to, to make sure people could live full uh, productive and independent lives and wherever they needed extra inpatient care that would be available to them too. Well of course we all know what ended up happening. The money that was supposed to follow people from uh, the institutions into the community never ha followed them. And then, of course, cutting back on institutional care became a quick, easy way to cut budgets. And uh, we saw the, that accelerate through the 80s. Uh, we all recall that. And then what had, ended up happening is people got pushed out onto the streets and into jails. And so that our jails and prisons today have ended up becoming where people have become reinstitutionalized. So the whole goal 50 years ago was to get people out of institutions. And what of what's our final scorecard read? Our final scorecard reads we've just reinstitutionalized them. And and I think in this election cycle, which is a watershed, whenever you have kind of a presidential election, it it, it elevates uh, our thinking in terms of how are we going to approach this in a new way. We have a historic moment in time to one, make good on the concept that we're no longer going to have a sick care system, which is why we were driving for a health care system, that we're going to now make sure mental health is included in overall health, that we're going to uh, move forward and, and, and move in those directions and make sure that we make good on on the promise of, of caring for people in the least restrictive environment. But that cannot be taken for granted. So what we also need to do is not only put together our uh, issues and our policy objectives, but we need to put together the politics behind that. Um, now when we passed the parity bill, it was passed on a bipartisan basis. Can you imagine that? I mean, in this day and age, it's hard to imagine anything having bipartisan support. But it passed because somehow mental illnesses and addictions affected both Democrats and Republicans. I mean, it was a pretty remarkable thing uh, how it, it was uh, this illness knew no partisan boundaries. So, you know, you had my, my father and I on the Democratic side. You had Jim Ramstead and Pete Domenici on the Republican side. And we had President George W. Bush who put the signature on it. Um, and he put the signature on it on the same desk that John F. Kennedy put the signature on the Community Mental Health Act. I mean, can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so, uh, that kind of brings us to, to today. Um, I, uh, you know, tried to advance public policy. In the book that I wrote, I put... Uh, a section in there about one mind, which is my effort to try to how do we advance public policy in neuroscience, which like the delivery system in mental health is very siloed um, and which shouldn't be given the nature of what we can do today with big data and our ability to coalesce around the brain as opposed to a disease. Um, so again, it's a process issue, but it's fundamental to accelerating research into neuroscience. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I knew this JFK thing worked out so well, I, um, I launched that on the anniversary of President Kennedy's moonshot speech, uh, saying uh, that, you know, we should have a race to inner space. <laughs> you like that? No, <laughs> So, uh, you know, I got a bunch of uh, neuroscientists to the, to the John F. Kennedy Library for that anniversary, and I, I called them all astronauts, and they loved it. <laughs> so, they were willing to do whatever I asked after that. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, um, that's all uh, the policy stuff in the book. So, why tell my own story and that of my family? Because I realized that you can never get to the policy, either on the neuroscience front or on the mental health delivery front, if you don't address the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room 
in every living room in this country is the fact that we don't want to talk about one of our family members suffering from one of these brain illnesses in a way that we would have no trouble discussing if it were cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or asthma. We would discuss these issues. In fact, we would do everything we could to make sure that we and our family members got the best care in the quickest possible fashion that we could possibly think of. Because you know what? We're all wanting to live healthier lives and longer lives. And why we would wait if there was a chance that we could intervene with an illness and catch it at its very beginning and stave off all the disability and sometimes ultimate death of ignoring an illness. I mean, that's how we treat every other illness. You know, you need cancer screening, they got it. You need screening for this, they got it. You need screen, well, we're paying for that because we don't want you to, not, to get sick and then have to take care of you. Isn't it funny, the only set of illnesses where we don't get in there early and try to treat them effectively are brain-related illnesses. Defies logic that the most important organ of our bodies is the most neglected organ of our bodies. The most important organ to who we are as people and how we perceive the world and how we enjoy each other's company and the life around us we neglect. You can't make this up. So if we're going to change public policy, we've got to change the conversation. And the reason the conversation doesn't change is because no one's lining up in Washington, D.C. saying, you know, these are the policy objectives we expect the administration and the Congress to adopt these things. And you know why that advocacy is not there? Because there's, it's representative of the fact that none of us in our own lives or families want to put our hands up like we would if we had cancer and say, I'm a cancer survivor. Imagine, I'm a bipolar survivor. I am an addiction survivor. I've had four and a half years of continuous, uninterrupted sobriety, but no one's going to pat me on the back for that in this society. They're all going to ask, well, what happened to you when you were in your illness? I don't know about anybody else, but if you're cancer free, they don't uh, say, well, what was it like, you know, over getting that chemotherapy, or how was it that you got? that diagnosis of a tumor. They say, thank God. And isn't that terrific? And where do I sign up to put my t-shirt on and join that walk? I mean, isn't this something? That, that with the brain, we do not want to talk about it. And our family members don't want to talk about it. Why? Because we are all suffering a collective hangover. And for those of you who, unlike me, are not in recovery from alcohol and addiction and don't know what a hangover is, we are, as a society, in the collective hangover of a moral judgment on people that says that when they act in a certain way that is contrary to everything that it means to be a human being, which is that we want the love and affection of our friends and our family members. We want to be popular and appreciated and respected. I mean, that's basic to human nature. No, no. If we have one of these illnesses, we like to get up every morning and do everything we can to upset everyone around us and alienate ourselves from them and do our best to really upset them and, and have them judge us and castigate us and tell us, well, when are you ever going to get yourself together? 
and blame us. I mean, I'm telling you, this is something that, you know, we, you know, think about a lot. You know, we just try to think, of how can I get up this morning and really upset everybody that's the closest to me? I mean, that's what these illnesses are. It's just as if that's a choice we make every morning. Like, let me see, how many times can I jeopardize my political career? You know, I already got into this scrape. I got into this scrape. I did this. Oh, my God. Patrick, how did you end up doing that again? Don't you know better? And the answer is, of course I knew better. And that's the conundrum. How is it that behavior is a symptom of brain biology? You know, how do we understand that nexus? Because you can walk on any major street in America and say, oh, well, that's that person's choice. Sleep on the sidewalk, panhandle. They just should get a job. Are you kidding me? That is the antithesis of what it is to be a social person. And all of us at our heart want to be embraced and loved and be able to be part of as opposed to you know, part of, apart from. So, you know, we have to have this conversation. And is it going to be an easy conversation? Obviously it's not. But I hope that when my three, soon to be four ch children grow up, they're not going to have to be quiet anymore when it comes to either their parents or their siblings speaking up if one of our family members is suffering from the debilitating impact of a mental illness and addiction because there will no longer be that specter of shame over these illnesses anymore. People are going to say, well, you need to go and get a checkup, a checkup from the neck up. You know what? It looks as though your cholesterol is good today, but as far as your, you know, dopamine levels, they're a little low. You might need to get a little insulin. You know, that's the kind of conversation that we're going to have. And we're not going to do what also happened for too long within the HIV AIDS community. And that's let our silence continue to be our death. Because remember, there was a generation ago where people did not want to be diagnosed with AIDS. And guess what happened? A lot of people died of AIDS that may not have had to have died, but for the fact they felt so ashamed to have a physical illness that today, frankly, is treated as a chronic illness and which results in very little impact on overall mortality. Who would have imagined? So I'm hopeful that we can make change. And keep in mind, I think mental illness and addiction is the last medical taboo. And so that's why I think uh, we have a great opportunity to be part of a generation, just as this generation said, finally, sayonara to discrimination to the LGBT community. Finally, we can be a generation that says, this stuff is outdated. Why are we acting in this way? It undermines our overall health as a, as a family and as a society, and we should do things differently. And that's what I hope uh, will ultimately come to pass. And in writing my book, I was hoping that I could at least get some folks at home thinking, well, you know, can you believe those candidates? I mean, oh my God. And then someone hopefully would then be able to say, yeah, but Harry, I mean, how much different is it in our family? <laughs> and, uh, that's my hope in writing a common struggle. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So you're absolutely right. You know, it's enough. 
if you're a white person and you're dealing with discrimination because you have a illness that is um, prejudiced in society. Another thing if you're dealing with a, a double discrimination because of the color of your skin and the continued racism in society, you got a mental illness and, and I'm African American, now you really think I'm going to get out there? I mean, it's not surprising that stigma is even greater in the minority communities for exactly the reason you state. And that is, it's enough to try to shoulder the burden of having to be a person uh, of color in this country where there's still rampant racism. And now you expect the person to put their hand up and say they also have an illness that is itself discriminated against. Of course it's going to be a bigger challenge. And that's why we got to work harder on trying to get voices in the community as courageous as you are to speak out about it. And I'm happy to tell you that um, uh, David Satcher, who was the Surgeon General of the United States who wrote the first uh, uh, mental health report, Surgeon General Mer Mental Health Report, uh, he is very conscious of this because as a, a physician in training, uh, he was in charge, he was told, you have to deal with this uh, psychiatric patient. This was back in the 60s. And he said, why me? He said, because you're the only African-American doctor we got in the hospital. And the patient's African-American. And they don't want to talk to anybody else. And, and this is David Satcher who became Surgeon General of the United States and wrote the authoritative Surgeon General Support on Mental Health. And where did it all start? He was like, oh my God, the notion of cultural competence and how race plays a role in this. Was, it was this first real appreciation about the intersection of race and untreated mental illness. And uh, so, but we have uh, a long ways to go uh, in trying to break those double stigmas down uh, within the minority community. So thank you for trying to speak up and keep, keep going. That's, we need you out there. So, first of all, as I said earlier, we let people get sick before we begin to, you know, they, we wait till they have stage four addiction, you know, before we start thinking about treatment. Oh, how bad is it? Well, you know, not that bad yet. You know, oh, wait so long. You know, like, when does it get bad enough for people to need uh, access to care and treatment? So, like, as I said, I don't mean to, hit this too hard, but if it were diabetes, you don't wait till you have to have your legs amputated before you get care. You get the, you know, insulin, you get the test strips, you get family counseling and education, you get nutrition support, you get this, 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 all paid for by insurance. You know, in fact, they're in trying to find out how many people in your family have diabetes because we want to catch this early. Now, when do physicians ask how many people in your family have had, suffered from an addiction or alcoholism? I mean, can you imagine a doctor asking you that? But they do it for every other illness. And if we're going to truly maximize the early intervention, you take that. And then you take another set of questions, you know, like these uh, adverse childhood experience questions, these ACE scores. Now, if you check off a number, a number of these criteria, you grew up in a home where there was domestic violence. You know, one of your parents is in jail. One of them is in treatment or is, isn't in treatment but needs it. You know, you've grown up in poverty. You've been a victim of violence. I mean, check, check, check. Now, if you score high on one of those ACE scores, well, you are high risk. And they can do that in, you know, early elementary school, you know, they can do, but of course, no, no, can't ask those questions. Those are personal questions. How are we ever going to beat this thing if we don't get in there with everything we've got? 
instead of waiting and waiting and waiting and then wonder, well, treatment doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work. Try measuring the success rate of people with stage four cancer and see how many of them don't make it. That's the answer. So unless you are ready to do what we do with cancer, don't ask me about, well, how are we going to have treatment that works because it's 90%. You know what? We haven't, we've like, we haven't even come to the table yet to avert this crisis. And you're, you're blaming the lack of recovery based upon the old model of care. So you're blaming the patients for the, the ridiculousness of the current model of care and saying it's their fault they don't get it together or, you know, it's the, it's the rehab's fault. You know, frankly, the rehab's are just going with where the money is. That's not the model of care either. Sure, people need, you know, to detox and have an adequate respite. But we need, as I said, have chronic disease management as the model of care. And if you do, yes, people will bounce along, but they'll slowly do better. Why? Because there are enough, there is enough evidence out there as to what works. Do we pay for what works? Sorry, we don't. And, you know, it's just to me shocking that we're not doing what we know works. And that includes really um, an orthodox thing like giving people medication to assist them in early treatment. Now that's heresy if you come from the 12-step recovery movement because you know, anything with that medication treatment, that's just, you know, you're, might as well like check your credentials as a uh, bona fide member of 12-step recovery if you even mention that because that's just not the way we do things. Hello, when do we follow the science? And the evidence, which says that it's not all one thing, it's not all the other. It happens to be often a combination of things. And so all I would say to you is we could do these things if we were comprehensive in our approach. If it wasn't a one-size-fits-all abstinence, a one-size-fits-all inpatient treatment, a one-size-fits-all you know, this or that, how about we do like we do with every other illness and have a little bit of everything. As the disease state determines, we need to do it for that particular individual. That, if we're serious about it, ought to be the approach that we take with these illnesses. In my book, I talk about this one mind for research. And the co concept, as I said, is that I launched it on the anniversary of John F. Kennedy's moonshot. And when some of you, I could see from looking in the audience and some of your gray hair, may have been around back then. <laughs> <clears throat> and you may recall the word Sputnik. Because the reason we did that was because we were in the Cold War and we had to beat the Russians. It was national security. <laughs> That's what also got us to do the Manhattan Project, national security. So I think what's going to drive the race to inner space, brain research, is national security. <clears throat> and I could mean that the disability of all brain-related illnesses, from Alzheimer's to autism to addiction, and that's just the A's. You know, going on through. But what I mean is something more specific. The signature wounds of war in Iraq and Afghanistan were traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. And what we are doing in one mind is coalescing <clears throat> all the neurodegenerative disorders around traumatic brain injury. To your point, when you have a traumatic brain injury, all kinds of disability happens in your brain. Inflammation that creates kinds of things like epilepsy, kinds of things like Parkinson's, kinds of things like dementia and Alzheimer's, 
and ALS. And by the way, very good research on autism is also relevant to those with traumatic brain injury and vice versa. In other words, by tackling the issue that is front and center for our soldiers, we learn not only how to better save our soldiers, but we'll learn also how to save all Americans who suffer from the you know, symptoms of illnesses that are a direct result of traumatic brain injury. So look up One Mind for research, because that we're, we're launching a longitudinal trial. And guess what we're, we've advocated for? Common data elements, not only in the United States, but in Europe. So we've partnered with Europe to, so it's not the Tower of Babel. You get my point? Like it's not Mass General here doing one study and Johns Hopkins doing another and UCLA doing, because that's the way science is done today, my friends, honestly. Everybody's doing their own science. Nobody's using a common platform common protocol. So not only are we doing it domestically, we've partnered to use the same protocols in all of the European Union. And you know who found out about it? The Australians. They're doing it across Australia. And you know who else found out about it? The Chinese. They're doing the same protocols, methodology, and common data elements for the Chinese. Now you're talking. Because if you want to get to understand the brain, this can't be a United States challenge alone. We need the whole world to be part of helping to solve the most complex organ of, of the body. So back to your point about the concussions. I'll just say this. If you have a concussion, chances are if you live a long life, you will probably have dementia before most others who haven't had concussions. But what no one realizes is that if you've had a concussion, the symptoms of that concussion when you're young is in impulsiveness, is in depression, is in anxiety. Those are the symptoms of concussion. And because we don't understand that, you're seeing high you know, suicide rates. I would imagine there's probably a strong correlation to a lot of that to people's earlier experience of a traumatic brain injury. Because somewhere along the line, you have more impulse control problems because of the concussion. And you have greater depression because of the concussion. And no one knows that, except I know something about it, because I talked to a lot of neuroscientists. And they're telling me that tau build up in the brain as a result of concussion when they do these autopsies of these youngsters who die prematurely, it's, it's, they often find a lot of tau as a result of concussions that they never knew were there. And a lot of these people have, have died because of suicide and, and other violent means. So you, you, your, your own experience is very, you've intuited very well that it, it, there is a correlation. And I think the science still needs to work on it, but I think you're, you're right on with your instincts. Well, the only thing I can tell you is that um, it's very difficult being a family member, someone who's suffering like this as well. And you, in order to be of maximum use to him, need to make sure that your own mental health is uh, as good as it can be under the circumstances. And that means that um, you're not alone in this. And I bet you Steve in the back there will tell you that there are lots of support groups for family members whose loved ones are in the exact same place that um, your sibling's in right now. And there is an answer, and the answer is don't be alone with it yourself. And all of a sudden, you'll talk to your fellows who are also in recovery of, from being a family member of someone with one of these illnesses. And they'll tell you their experience. And they'll tell you their strength and their hope. And all of a sudden, you won't feel alone. And you also have someone to call when you're feeling like this. And they'll be able to say, I've been through that. And I know just, and here's what I did. It may or may not, and here's somebody who I talked to, and this is what they shared with me, and all of a sudden, 
you're getting good advice because it's coming from people who've walked in the same path that you've walked in, but they've done it before you. So um, my prayers go to you and, and to your brother. And I know everybody in this room tonight's gonna go home and think about you tonight. The bottom line is we just saw with this uh, study that the NIMH released two days ago on schizophrenia is that it was finally discovered what we already knew intuitively and that is combined therapy approaches work best. Hello, what a miracle that you don't just put someone on meds and expect them to recover. You. And by the way, if you, if you have companion ther talk therapy, and guess what? You bring the family in, guess what happens? The person does much better, and they don't have to be on the same amounts of medication. So my friends, we can't be reactionary, because unfortunately, we have these ideologies that occupy a lot of energy on both ends of the debate on this. We've got to be scientific because the, the brain is an organ like any other organ, and a biomedical approach with peer support, family support, cognitive behavioral therapy, supportive housing, you know, a good diet, maybe some exercise. Guess what? It's all part of the answer. It's not one versus the other. So I'm not gonna fall into that trap by saying, oh, it's just this way. Because my friends, that's the reason we're in the trouble we're in today, is we cannot hear each other say that maybe it's a combination approach and depending on what the own person's needs are, you know, one aspect of this therapeutic approach may be more efficacious than another. And that's why we need to have a comprehensive approach. Thank you all very much. Nations are disappearing. People are dying. Mass extinction is unfolding. And all of it sooner and faster than science predicted.